All right, welcome to our next subunit. Um, in this um, video, we're going to be looking at the art of ancient Greece. Um, and a Greek philosopher um, said that, a uh, quote that really sums up, I think, what Greek art is about, um, and this was Protagoras, um, man is the measure of all things. Um, so in this segment, we're going to be learning how um, Greeks really appreciated um, this idea of measure, proportion, and reason. Um, the Greeks, like the civilizations that came before them, worshipped gods, but as a quote from Protagoras indicates, they also valued humanity. Although their gods were portrayed as idealized and beautiful beings, they looked like humans and had some human weaknesses. The emphasis on the individual led the Greeks to practice democracy. Um, the word means ruled by demos or people. Although their society did not give equal rights to women or slave, um, their great advances in philosophy, mathematics, and the sciences continue to influence our thinking up to the present day. So, um, athleticism was important. Here, let me bring up the map. So, um, we're going to be sort of hanging out, um, you know, in this area right here. Um, athleticism was very important to Greek culture, and the Greeks held um, sporting contests, um, the origins of the modern Olympic Games at which individuals compete for glory and money. Um, were started by the Greeks. Sculptures of men were predominantly of the nude body, shown with ideal proportions. For the Greeks, the idealized human form represented high intellectual um, and moral goals. Indeed, Greek architecture was based on mathematics and systems of proportion similar to those applied to the human um, form. Um, Greeks prided um, their own physical and intellectual achievement. So that's something um, new um, that we're seeing. You know, before with other cultures, you know, the deities and the rulers were really um, sort of is what the emphasis was. But now we're starting to see humans um, sort of being introverted and sort of reflecting on their own humanity and how they um, relate to the world and interact with it. Sorry, my, I'm using my MacBook and it's doing weird things with this um, screencast-o-matic. Um, so Greece is what we would consider a rational culture. It believed in rational answers to questions of earthly life. Um, it assumed that consistent laws governed the universe. They thought about how stars moved, materials that um, composed the universe, mathematical law that governed harmony and beauty, geometry and physics. Um, they had enormous respect for human beings and what they could accomplish with their minds and bodies. Um, they were considered humanist, an idea that would be reborn in the Renaissance um, later on. Um, this is very different from the period following classical antiquity, which is the Middle Ages, um, with its sense of body um, as sinful. Um, and this is something that came to dominate Western Europe um, after this um, Greek classical period um, when Christianity um, became the dominant religion. We'll see um, this idealized, beautiful, nude body um, sort of um, shift into uh, a very stylized, flat, <laughs> clothed, um, you know, body. Um, and so nudity was considered shameful in the medieval period. And so art really begins to assume a status of its own for its own sake as well. Um, and and not just, um, it's not just an offspring for religion and politics. So that's something different that we'll see um, with um, Greek culture. All right, so the first period in Greek culture we're going to be looking at is called the Archaic Period. And this goes from 600 to 480 BCE. Archaic means antiquated or old-fashioned. The archaic Greek period does not deserve this name. It was a term chosen by art historians who wanted to stress what they preserved as a contrast between the undeveloped art of this time and the later classical period, which um, they became, you know, the Greeks are very well known for. All right, um, so in terms of painting, archaic Greece, Greek vase painting um, was very popular. Um, vase painting during the archaic period um, lends itself to a more full body 
interpretation of the figure compared with earlier geometric and or orientalizing styles that we might have seen um, in past cultures with um, you know Egyptian and Mesopotamia like the um, and we're gonna look at um, some sculpture you, you got an introduction to them yesterday the chorus figures um, the chorus figures, those um, kind of statues of, of men and women, um, we see that they the figures have these large, wide open eyes. Again, this is very reminiscent of ancient Near Eastern art um, and Egyptian art. Um, they have this tight lip, archaic smile, um, which you can sort of see here. Um, and um, the smile repeatedly occurs no matter what conditions are represented. Um, so even if they're in battle um, or being torn apart, <laughs> they always maintain the sort of archaic smile, very calm. Um, and so the smile was meant to portray a sense of ethos and calmness. Um, some geometric markings fill up the space around um, these vases that you can see. And this is a term called hora vacui. And what that means is the fear of negative space. Um, this notion reflects the idea as the artist began, um, and as the artist being an intermediary between the sacred world and the familiar world. So they actually saw these art objects as sort of um, intermediaries or objects that connected us to the sacred world. And so if there was too much negative space open, um, you know, bad spirits could kind of come into our world. Um, so each vase that the artist created is a window between um, the, the, the real world and the sacred world. Um, to leave any empty space is like having a window open where negative elements from the sacred world could come through. And so they tried to close these windows by um, having a lot of decorations in the negative space. All right, so this is a very famous um, Greek vase um, painting by Exekius. So we also are starting to have, um, instead of the artist being anonymous, we're starting to have artist names, and you need to know them. And he was a, a very well-known potter and painter. Um, and so this is a style of vase painting called black figure vase style. And so it's, it's basically um, painting over red clay with black slip, um, then incising away lines and details um, to get the image. There's a video that I'll upload into your resource folder um, showing you this technique. Um, so take the time to watch it. Um, Potters and painters also began to sign their work. So that's a really interesting development too, where we have, you know, this sort of the identity of the artist being developed where they do want credit for their work. Um, Exekius was one of the most famous black figure style painters and took a lot of his subjects from Greek mythology. So what you're looking at here is Ajax and Achilles. Oops, sorry, messing up here. All right. So there's a close-up, and we'll, we'll talk about some of the stylistic elements. So um, on the vase painting, we see Ajax and Achilles playing a, a game uh, of checkers or chess the, uh, during a moment of calm during the Trojan War. Um, you can see archaic style art conventions are present with these kind of large eyes, um, the archaic smile. Um, again, that was supposed to ref reflect this type of ethos and calmness within the anguish of the Trojan War. Um, and the scene also reflects, and this is another vocabulary word for you guys, sum sumetria, S-Y-M-M-E-T-R-I-A. And this was a Greek concept of balance made of smaller imbalances um, that created a more dynamic composition than mere symmetry. Um, so we're going to compare um, the figures of Achilles and Ajax. So, and it's very similar. This is really similar to um, the Stele of Hammurabi that we talked about in terms of how the artist was able to sort of balance the composition and as well as the status of, of the ruler and the god. Um, we see something similar happening here, but a little bit more developed. Um, Achilles, um, he has a helmet, um, and his helmet makes him taller. So this is Achilles over here. Um, he has two spears. Um, that are thinner but spaced apart. Um, Ajax helmet is placed 
on his shield back here, um, making him almost as tall, about as tall as Achilles. His two spears make a thicker line equivalent um, to Ajax's more spaced apart um, spear. So this is what they're talking about, this balance of imbalances. Um, Greek ceramic painters also highly, um, also highly uh, were accomplished at accommodating their pictures to sort of the awkward, um, you know, the awkward shape of um, these vase, these vases. Um, so hunched backs of the two figures of Achilles and Ajax sort of mimic the curvature of the vase shape. So, you know, it's hard to paint on a, a surface like this, and so they really had to think about how they would compose the composition. So, so by portraying them sort of hunched back and playing this game, it fits um, the format of the vase nicely. All right. So, um, in the last part of the 6th century BCE, some vase painters turned to a less meticulous process known as red figure style. Red figure stands out against a black background, and so here you can see the, the difference with, with these two vases. Um, these were often called um, bilingual vases where the same subject um, would be done in, in, in each technique. Um, so here is, is the black figure, and then here is the red figure style. Um, the red figure painting style provided greater freedom and flexibility that resulted from painting details rather than engraved or incised details done with the black figure style. This technique led to more lively figures and a more developed sense of um, anatomical form. Um, ancient Greek paintings on ceramics involved applying a layer of slip, um, a mixture of clay and water to select parts of a vessel surface and then carefully manipulating the firing process to control the amount of oxygen allowed to interact with the objects in the kiln. The firing process involved three stages. In the first stage, oxygen was allowed into the kiln, which fixed the vessel in an overall red color, whose shade depended on the composition of the clay. In the second stage, known as the reduction stage, the oxygen in the kiln was reduced to um, a minimum. The lack of oxygen turned the entire vessel black, and the temperature inside the kiln was raised to the point at which the slip um, became partially glass-like or um, vitrified. In the third stage, oxygen was allowed back into the kiln, which caused the unslipped areas to return to a shade of red. Um, but this um, vitrified, or the sort of very shiny, um, areas where slip had been applied were sealed against the oxygen and remained black. And so this is how they got this really beautiful technique. Um, in the red figure technique used here, artists painted the background around the forms, reserving unpainted areas for silhouetted figures and ornament. Um, within these reserved areas, they then painted details with a fine brush dipped in liquid slip. The result was a lustrous black vessel with a light colored um, figures and ornamental um, ornamental designs um, um, del um, delineated in fluid black lines. So, and again, the the two examples above were painted by um, and Dokies. I'm probably saying that wrong. Um, and and here you can see the artist is experimenting with both black and red figure style using the same composition. So these were really beautiful objects and very prized and, you know, considered very valuable objects. So here there's a close-up of the black figure compared to the red figure style. And, you know, I think you can sort of see the difference um, here where the red figure is painted and it looks a little bit more um, realistic and a little bit more lively. So this is a vase that you are responsible for knowing um, on the um, list of 250 approved AP works. Um, this is done with um, um, the red figure style, um, and Niobe, Niobid was the painter, and this is a crater. So the Greeks, you know, um, had different pots and styles of pots um, and vessels that they used mainly to store wine or make wine, and so this is one of those, um, these pots. Um, the Niobid painter um, probably was inspired by large frescoes that had been produced in Athens and um, Delphi. 
um, decorated, um, he decorated this exceptional crater with two scenes in which many figures rise in tears on lines of ground that evoked an undulating landscape. Um, on one side, Apollo and Artemis are shown um, decimating the children of Niobe um, with their arrows. On the other side, Her Hercules, surrounded by Athena and heroes in arms, in a composition whose serenity is already classical and whose meaning is still uncertain. Um, so it has um, some feeling of maybe, you know, the way some Greek... Um, I mean, not Greek, Egyptian sort of narratives and registers were done. You know, these figures do sort of stand on their own sort of ground line. Obviously, the figures are a bit more anatomical and more fluid and definitely more lifelike. So here, oops, here is a up close so you can see in greater detail. So this side of the vase illustrates a legend that is rarely represented and gave the painter its name. So again, the painter is sort of unknown. We don't know his name, but he's referred to as the Niobid painter based on the mythologi mythological scene that's being depicted here. Here we see the massacre, massacre of the children of Niobe by Apollo and Artemis. Niobe, the mother of seven girls and seven boys, had bragged that she was superior to the goddess Leto, um, who had only two children. These two children, Apollo and Artemis, hastened to avenge the honor of their mother by killing all the children of, of this unfortunate mortal. This is the moment that the painter has chosen to represent, the divine archers shooting down the Niobids with their arrows. Half of them are already lying dead on the ground. It's a pretty morbid scene. Note how the two gods are presented in formal composite view, um, and the slain children are in more naturalistic view. So we still have that sort of profile, frontal torso, and then um, profile legs that is, you know, coming you know, is a throwback or, you know, relates to Egyptian art, that composite um, human figure. And again, you know, we have to keep in mind that these cultures did coexist and, and often traded with each other. You know, a lot of these um, vases have been found in Egypt. Um, they were considered very valuable objects um, and were traded. So here you sort of see the gods are represented in these composite forms and then the slain children are more naturalistic. So look at this and think about what else might be different in ancient Greeks um, cultures representation of gods and, and compare it um, to other cultures. So think about that for a minute and this is probably something we'll talk about in class as well. All right, so we're going to look at the other side of the vase. This side of the vase shows 11 figures placed at different levels. Only two of them are recognizable. Um, Hercules in the center holding his club and bow with his lion skin over his left arm and Athena on the left. Around them, seven warriors, all represented in various poses. Many questions have been asked about the meaning of this image. Um, two hypotheses um, that come, that frequent, um, frequently come up are um, the agronauts awaiting favorable winds and locus. Um, this is, I guess, some sort of mythological episode of Hercules um, descending into Hades to rescue um, Theseus and Perithius, who were guilty of trying to carry off Persephone. Um, a final, more recent hypothesis looks at the obvious emphasis given to Hercules, crowned with laurels, wrinkled and standing on a stepped base almost invisible to the naked eye. It is thought to be a statue of the deified hero after he has completed his exploits. We know from ancient sources that Hercules was thought to have helped um, Marathon um, to vic victory and was subsequently the object of a, a cult in Athens. We may therefore be seeing in this image the warriors of Marathon um, who come who have come to place themselves under the protection of the hero um, before battle. Let me see if I can zoom in. It's hard for me to do on my Mac. Um, but when I upload this PowerPoint, you can and you can kind of see these there's the base right there. And again, think about you know the attention to you know anatomy and muscular detail. I mean, and in these figures and obviously we have more realistic poses these sort of three-quarter poses 
Um, so definitely the figures are becoming much more natural and lifelike compared to sort of the flat figures from Egypt and Mesopotamia. So the stylistic characteristics of this crater owe much to contemporary sculpture and wall painting. The poses of the key figures, Artemis, Apollo, and Hercules, are reminiscent of those in um, um, severe um, style status. This is a, a type of sculpture we'll look at um, later. Um, However, by bringing in elements of wall painting, the painter has given the space its exceptional character. Wall painting was a major art form that developed considerably during the late 5th um, century BC um, and is now only known to us through written accounts. So uh, a lot of these murals and wall paintings that were done during this time um, were destroyed or, you know, um, disintegrated. Um, uh, there these probably involved complex compositions um, that were perfected with um, involved numerous figures placed at different levels. Um, this is the technique we find here for the first time on a vase. Um, so what they're saying is that this this is probably a good example of what um, wall paintings were like um, during this time period in Greece. Um, and so it's unusual to actually see this technique on a vase painting. Um, so this is the te technique we find here where for the first time on a vase, the traditional um, is <laughs> isothelia of a composition. This is where, this is an idea where the heads all um, sort of are lined up. Um, um, all the figures are approximately at the same level, um, have been abandoned. Um, so, you know, again, when we look at Egyptian or Mesopotamian art, you know, everyone's sort of lined up in, you know, a very orderly way and all their heads sort of line up. Here we see that a lot of the figures are kind of staggered. Um, and so that, that technique or that stylistic convention has been abandoned that we saw in earlier Greek um, and Egyptian and um, Mesopotamian art.